Now that we have covered all of the core components of a Linux system, we can wrap up this series with some information which can prove to be useful for those of you who are transitioning from Windows or from, for those of you who have been using Linux for a while but don't know what some of these things are. You are watching Episode 6 of the Layman's Guide to Linux, and today we will examine the file system and permissions right now on Spatry's Cup of Linux. Let's begin. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, and this should be a good one for you guys. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank all the community members who support this channel through their financial contributions. I would also like to thank everyone who has provided feedback on the content that we have in this series. This episode is just for you. All right. If you've ever used Windows, you might be surprised to know that there are no drive letters in Linux. This illustration shows a possible drive layout on a typical Windows system. On Linux, the root directory represents the drive on which the system is installed. That would be drive C in Windows. Other drives can be mounted or unmounted in any empty directory in the file system. By mounting a disk, you attach the root directory of this disk to a directory in the file system. After that, you can access the disk like it were part of your system. In most Linux distributions, USB keys and CDs are automatically mounted when they are inserted or attached. And the default mount directory is a subdirectory of slash media or slash MNT call slash mount or, or mount whatever you want to call it there for example your first cd-rom drive might be mounted at slash media slash cd-rom o while the contents of a usb key might be accessible through slash media slash usb zero for drives you permanently install in your system the slash etsy slash fstab file can be used to define mount points so that your hardware can be mounted at boot time. You can also mount hard disks and media manually using the shell. I show this in practice in my CLI friendly playlist during an Arch Linux installation. Interestingly, your drives also have device listings in the Linux file system as illustrated in this example. Files cannot be accessed directly from these listings unless they are mounted first, and then you would access the drive contents from their mount points as shown in the previous slide. It is always a good idea to know where your devices are located in the slash dev folder when you want to use the command line to perform administrative operations, such as wiping a hard disk or installing a live image to a thumb drive for booting at a later time. Now, let's move on to the directory structure in a little more detail. If you compare the Windows folder structure to the Linux file system, you will see there are some major differences. At first glance, many years ago, when I first tried Linux, I found the Linux file system to be confusing until I gained an understanding of how data is organized. When I think of the differences between the Windows layout versus the Unix-style placement, which Linux employs, I can see that the later design is logical and intuitive. Don't believe me? Let me break it down for you. This slide illustrates a possible root folder configuration. Depending on the distribution you use, your folder layout will be similar to this, but some of your directories could have different names. At the top of the structure is root, designated with a forward slash. This is the highest you can go in a Linux file system. Directories in root are as follows. The slash bin directory contains pre-compiled programs or binaries. 
hence the name bin. It also contains scripts and other executable files. On many Linux systems, the slash bin directory is a link to slash user slash bin, and the binaries contained therein are for users to run as needed. The slash boot directory contains all files needed to start up your computer. This includes your bootloader software, boot image, and your kernel. Slash dev, as stated earlier, contains your devices installed on your system. Slash Etsy, E-T-C, originally named after etc., contains human readable text files and configurations for your system-wide settings. In other words, these settings affect all users on your machine. All settings are stored here from sound, networking, locales, language preferences, and more. Home contains the private files of users on your computer. It also stores settings specific to the user's preferences and can often override system-wide settings. An interesting feature of the slash home directory is that its subfolders are transportable, meaning that you could move Bob and Jill's settings onto another Linux distribution and all of their preferences will remain intact. Their web browser settings will be usable and the way their software was configured will be remembered. They will have access to all of their spreadsheets and personal files. That is power. The slash MNT or media directory is where your drives are mounted so that you can access the files. Some Linux operating systems can optionally mount files to the slash run slash media directory. Some binaries can get installed to the slash opt directory. This is for the installation of add-on application software packages. Of interest, I have noticed software and its own libraries being installed here. On my machine, for example, that would be Firestorm and Motion, but there can be other programs installed there as well. So, your users have their preferences, but did you know that your root account can also have preferences as well? Absolutely. If you look in the slash root directory, all of the settings for the administrator account are stored there. There is even a directory for executable files which can only be run as root, and those files are stored in slash sbin. The slash TMP or temp directory is where your system stores its temporary files. Next, we have user space. The slash user folder contains files and directories which are owned by the root file system, but permissions, which we will get into shortly, are granted to your user accounts. Themes, cursors, and wallpapers are usually stored in slash user slash share and executables you can run are usually stored in slash user slash bin as mentioned earlier and finally we have the slash ver directory and the variable directory is where you will find your system logs so now that we know where all of our files reside on our file system, now we get to explore something else that's really cool about Linux, and that is file permissions. Each file on your computer belongs to one of the users. That is, each file has an owner. Additionally, a file can be assigned to a group of users, but the owner must be a member of that group. Each file has three kinds of permissions. Read, write, and execute. These permissions can be assigned to three kinds of owner relations. You have owner, group, and then others. 
other includes all users who are not the owner of the file and do not belong to the group which owns the file. Only the file owner or the super user, root, can change the permissions or ownership of a file. This system allows precise control over who can do what on a given computer. Users can be prevented from modifying system files by removing the write permission from them or from executing certain commands by removing the execute permission. Notice that users may be allowed to execute programs but not alter them as is the case with the files in the slash user slash bin folder that I mentioned earlier. File permissions are usually given as three octal digits, each from zero to seven. The color-coded chart to my right explains what each value means. The three digits represent the permissions for the owner, group, and other users. For example, 777 allows everyone to read, write, or execute the file. 755 allows everyone to read or execute the file, but only the owner can write it. 400 allows the owner to read the file and no one else is allowed to do anything. 540 allows the owner to read or execute the file group members only to read the file and other users to do nothing. Anyway, if you want to edit files outside of your home directory, you would need to switch to elevated privileges. Great care must be taken when changing permissions in the root file system, otherwise you could harm your system. With great power comes even greater responsibility. Remember, Linux automatically assumes that you know what you are doing, and where Windows assumes its users are idiots, Linux demands proof. So please, please, please do the research before you go editing your system files. And this concludes our tour of the Layman's Guide to Linux. If you found this series to be useful to you, please consider supporting this channel by visiting cupoflinux.com and hitting the donate button. If you have ideas for upcoming playlists, please be sure to drop your suggestions on my forum in Spatry's inbox. It is the only place I am guaranteed to see your suggestions. I have so many videos on YouTube, it is impossible for me to keep track of incoming messages, so please use my forum at cupoflinux.com to contact me. Join me next time on Cup of Linux when I revisit one of my most popular topics ever. It's Linux does what Win don't. Until then, peace out.